type the word apple, you'll see that apple has just built one of its largest plants, uh, even bigger than the one in California, in Maiden, North Carolina. I could not believe it. So, to quote Bob Dylan, the times there are changing. And uh, you folks on the Planning Commission have a real task ahead of you, a lot of hard decisions, I'm sure, coming. Uh, I'm going to tap into one of the most controversial areas of wind turbines uh, tonight by talking about uh, noise and asking the question whether, uh, uh, whether noise uh, from wind turbines <coughs> cause uh, adverse uh, health effects. Uh, just for a minute, let me give you a brief summary of my background. Uh, one in this position always tries to establish his expertise. I'm not trying to boast my credentials. I just want you to know kind of where I came from. I have a PhD in audiology from Northwestern University, um, M uh, master's degree in audiology and speech pathology from Vanderbilt University, and a BA in psychology from Wake Forest University. Uh, I have over 40 years of clinical research and, and administrative experience as an audiologist. As Josh mentioned, I'm on the faculty at uh, Michigan State University. I'm now Professor Emeritus, which just means I'm old and retired. Um, but I am still pretty active in the areas I'm interested in, which is reason I'm here tonight, I guess. Um, I was chair for, of the department for six years. Uh, my earlier positions, a few, a few of my major positions have been the director of research at the American Speech Language Hearing Association in Rockville, Maryland, uh, chief of audiology at Indiana University School of Medicine, and senior research audiologist at Nicolay Instrument Corporation, where we developed the world's first digital hearing aid. Um, my, in terms of my professional interests and activities, uh, traditional interest of audiologists are these, and I'm interested in all these areas, hearing loss, hearing handicap, hearing aids, uh, sound and how humans process and perceive sound. Um, hearing conservation has been an interest of mine for the last maybe 15 years. Uh, hearing loss prevention, occupational hearing loss, I've done some testifying in courts uh, and given depositions on the in, in that area of occupational hearing loss. And more recently, in the last, I'd say, three years, I've become interested in, in wind turbine noise and how it affects communities. Uh, I visited the ugly uh, Michigan community in uh, the Thumb in the summer of 2009 and interviewed some families uh, who were living near wind turbines. And that really caught my attention as to what uh, some of the critical uh, issues might be in terms of health issues. Uh, you have a uh, access to a copy of an article we wrote, I wrote with Rick James and a, and a student, a graduate student, actually he was an honors senior student uh, at Michigan State uh, uh, last summer, uh, in which we reviewed the literature, the, basically the world's literature. It isn't every article ever published, but it's most of the peer-reviewed journals and, and, and some of the other literature as well. Uh, I chair the uh, Wind and Health Technical Work Group of the uh, DELEG, which is the Department of uh, energy, labor, and economic growth uh, in the state of Michigan, and our goal is to try to rewrite, revise the uh, wind turbine siting guidelines. I would say a copy of uh, the draft uh, that's going to be approved hopefully will be available in the next two or three weeks. We're having a tough time getting our approval for everything we want to do here, but uh, uh, we are working with people from the wind industry, uh, from the Public uh, Service Commission, uh, from Delegate itself, and uh, from other uh, areas of, uh, uh, that are concerned about this issue of uh, wind turbines. Uh, so uh, our, my goal, uh, I was given 30 minutes. I, I, I don't want to take quite that much time. I want to leave some time for questions. I said if I'm going to drive from Lansing, I'd really like 30 minutes instead of 15. But I appreciate your being here, and I will try, try to make this as quick as I can. The slides you have in your hand uh, from the, the handouts um, is, are pretty long. Some of them are pretty full of text. Uh, I give you that mainly to take home. You might, as you sit here, uh, mark a few things on the slides that you want to ask questions about when we finish. Uh, but I'd ask you try to kind of concentrate on what I'm saying or trying to say here, and maybe keeping your mind on the slides here would be a little better than thumbing through those. But anyway, I want you to have those to take home. Uh, I want to describe briefly the sources of wind, uh, of noise, whether it comes from wind turbines, and talk a little bit about the special characteristics that wind turbine noise have. I want to also describe the range of uh, research studies that are helpful in uh, helping us to uh, make sense of the associations between wind turbine noise and possible health effects. 
Some of that may be cause and effect. Some may just be associations. Uh, the reason being, of course, is because, as I said, this is a very controversial area. And one of the biggest criticisms of people like me from the wind industry is that they say, uh, basically, there's no uh, good peer-reviewed scientific basis for stating that there is an association between health problems and wind turbine noise. So I want to talk a little bit about the kinds of studies that can be done and have been done in the field uh, and to evaluate the uh, scientific credibility or validity of some of these uh, uh, claims that have been made about wind turbine noise and health effects, which I'll describe. Uh, the third bullet described the health effects that researchers attribute to wind turbine noise. I definitely hit that pretty hard. Some opening kind of comments here are that, uh, just to get your thoughts uh, moving in this direction, uh, to talk about research and to talk about its validity, I think I'd like to make several uh, key points. First of all, most of the research that's been done has been done outside the U.S because uh, the European countries, the Scandinavian countries, and others have, have had wind turbines a lot longer than we've had them in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. government does, funds a great deal of research on green energy, which it should, but uh, provides very little funding for um, studying health effects so far. Not that they won't, they just haven't so far. Uh, some of the data that I'll talk about toward the end of my presentation will be from basic research as opposed to applied research studies that are aimed specifically at determining uh, answers to questions that we would have uh, here in this room about wind turbines and health effects. Uh, would, would, those kinds of studies would be called applied research, but there just hasn't been a whole lot done, and we'll talk about the ones that have been done. But we will also talk a little bit about some basic research that does start, is starting to provide some answers to these questions. Uh, the wind industry, in my view, will not fund uh, research that uh, they think reveals negative effects. I say that as a person who worked in industry. Uh, we did hearing aid research and some of the findings on our product were not as good as the management would like to hear, so they were suppressed. That's one reason I left. Uh, I wasn't very happy with that, but that's kind of the way the world works. Uh, and I can understand it, but it's, it's kind of hard to spend a lot of time doing research and finding negative things that your company doesn't want you to uh, talk about. If the companies uh, did find negative, uh, if there were negative impacts from uh, wind turbines, they're not very likely to reveal them, to report them. It's, I think that's a simple fact of life. Uh, the, the wind industry constantly tells us that there's no way we can uh, provide evidence, there's no evidence to back claims that there's a relationship between health effects and wind turbine noise. But I just point out here that the wind industry itself has never provided one iota of data indicating that there are no health effects from wind turbines. Okay? Uh, I like to talk about pro-wind versus pro-health. It's, uh, it's not fair to call pro people who are talking about health issues pro-health folks, perhaps like myself, as anti-wind any more than it's good to, to, to talk about uh, pro-wind people as uh, anti-health. Okay? So on a, on a, let's be on a level, put things on a level playing field. The, the basic contention of the, what I'll call the pro-win uh, uh, industry is that, as I said before, there's really no definitive research showing that these effects exist, these health effects from wind turbines. They say that what you can't, what you can't hear cannot possibly hurt you. Uh, Pro-health folks uh, say that there is some anecdotal and certainly some scientific evidence to indicate there is a relationship between health effects and wind turbine noise. Uh, and they would tell us, uh, they, they would phrase it this way, what you can't hear can hurt you. Uh, if you don't think that makes a lot of sense, think about what you can't smell can't hurt you. What you can't taste can't hurt you. Even what you can't see can't hurt you. It makes no more sense to say what you can't hear can't hurt you than it does to say any of those things. Okay? Think of salmonella. Uh, toxic agents of all kinds, uh, I can't think of a lot of them right now, but radiation, you can't even feel it at first. You can't see it, you can't taste it, etc. Uh, I'm going to bring in some uh, thoughts toward the end of this presentation that come back to that point. Uh, I like to be kind of honest with people, <laughs> as I can be. Uh, I think we all have biases. Uh, there's something called a confirmation bias that experts in communication talk about. 
uh, basically people have a tendency to favor those uh, those uh, facts or those those uh, things that they favor that, that that they believe in that they value and so forth we tend to prefer sources of information that uh, confirm our positions our existing positions and we also tend to interpret things that are rather ambiguous and unclear as evidence that that, su that, that supports our view. Um, I like to think of it as a lot of people are making, uh, are, are building evidence based on their preconceived notions and, and uh, decisions. What we ought to be doing, all of us, and this is true on both sides of the aisle, both, both sides, what we need are evidence-based decisions where we depend on uh, uh, real-world observations to to base our opinions and uh, decisions upon. The World Health Organization is a good example uh, of an organization that emphasizes that th this type of evidence-based, uh, excuse me, evidence-based decisions should be based on uh, uh, making, uh, that is, decisions should be based on real evidence, based on real-world observations in science, in, particularly when it comes to making health policy, policy decisions. What constitutes evidence? And this gets a little bit esoteric, pardon me, I've been a professor too long perhaps, uh, but I, I think these are kind of critical uh, ways to think about uh, and, and useful ways to think about this, this situation. Uh, again, I want to get into uh, sort of evaluating the validity of these things, these, the, the research that has been done, and these things relate very much to, to that uh, aspect of it. Biological plausibility is the notion that uh, epidemiologists, those who study diseases, causes of diseases, the tracking of diseases, etc., uh, epidemiologists uh, use it to establish whether some external cause is at the root of any observed health condition. Um, basically, uh, they say, they ask the question, are conditions such that these relationships between things like wind turbine noise and adverse health effects, could they exist? Could that relationship exist? Are, are, are things that we can observe uh, in our studies and our observations in general, uh, are they sufficient to uh, let us answer yes to the question that it's conceivable that these conditions could occur? So that's a pretty low level uh, criterion, but it is one factor in, in evaluating uh, evidence. Uh, we can make direct and indirect observations. We do it all the time. You go to the doctor and have a health complaint. You don't expect the doctor to question you about what you're feeling or what your symptoms are and so on. Uh, health complaints of people living near wind turbines are pretty uh, numerous around the world. Uh, there are reports of people, and I'm not saying a lot of people, I'm saying there's a select few. There's uh, some people, certainly, uh, who have abandoned their homes. That's pretty good evidence something is wrong. People don't just get up and walk out of their homes, particularly like the home in Up, uh, the family in Ubley that just spent a lot of money renovating the home and then found that they could not live in it because the wind turbines were located right next to their property. Uh, there are newspaper and internet accounts of complaints, and there are lots of uh, evidence, I call it evidence, it's legal evidence, it's legal briefs and uh, uh, depositions uh, that have been given. Uh, those that I have available are basically from this country, not other countries. And then there's uh, research of two types. One is called observational, or some people call it descriptive research, and some people, uh, rather the other kind of research is experimental research. I just want to